Hello, and welcome to the podcast made to hopefully make you feel a little bit better about the world and a little bit more connected to the nonprofit world. We are going to be chatting with nonprofit leaders and founders, giving them a platform to share their stories and collaborate with others, because we believe that when we join hands, we can stand that much taller and make the world better. So sit back, plug in, and let's create some good. This is Nonprofit Connect with me, Matt Barnes. Welcome, welcome to 2024 and to Nonprofit Connect. I'm Matt Barnes, your host. And this is the first time I'm recording in 2024, so it's got to be special in some way, right? Unfortunately, Tiffany is not here with me today, my co-host for these intros. She is out with COVID. It's going around again, man. So we're wishing her a speedy recovery. And since I don't have her for the witty banter today, I'm going to kind of skip through this part and jump into the main thing. But I did want to let you know, if you want to connect with me, my handle is Matt from Rogue. And that's pretty much everywhere. If you're looking on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram or X, I still can't call it that X. Anyway, Twitter, whatever it is, I'm Matt from Rogue everywhere and you can connect with me there. Let me know what's going on, what shows you're binging, what I should be watching or what you want to hear more of on the podcast. We'd love to hear that as well. So I love connecting with you. So connect with me. Let's connect. It's nonprofit connect. That's the whole point, right? But today, speaking of connecting, and there's a transition, we're going to connect with a rad guest that I was so excited to talk with. His name is Cherry and Koshi. He is a fundraiser, a philanthropist, a board member, a keynote speaker, an author, a mentor, just all kinds of things. He's got over 25 years experience working in the nonprofit sector and a ton of experience working with a range of different causes. But he's also kind of a technical software genius, and he has put that genius to work for nonprofits. So during the pandemic, he founded the Nonprofit Operating System, which is an AI-driven platform enhancing nonprofit efficacy. Efficacy is a word you don't use enough, right? We don't hear that one enough. Anyway, and the whole idea was to make it easier for nonprofits to generate content and funds during a difficult time, like a pandemic. I don't know. So we talked a lot about that. We talked about a lot of things. We talked specifically, we got into talking about technology and AI and all of that in the nonprofit sector, which of course is the topic of the year last year but will be the topic of this year as well, I predict. Anyway, I'm not going to say much more. I'll let you just listen to what we had to say, and we'll get into it. We'll be right back with Cherry and Koshi right after this brief message. Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes is brought to you by Rogue Creatives. Did you know that your brand has a personality all of its own? Well, it does, or it should, but maybe it doesn't. How do you know if it does? Here's what you do. Ask yourself, does the way you describe your organization match the way you describe your branding? Because it really needs to. Why? Because people don't connect with organizations. They just don't. They don't feel connected to them. They they feel connected to characters. They feel connected to personality. So it's super important that your brand has a personality that connects with the right people to bring them into your story. And that's what Rogue Creatives is all about. We've developed our very own process called the Strategic Storytelling Framework to define your brand personality and create a brand foundation that will make sure your organization has that main character energy that connects with others and pulls them right into your story. And by the way, it works. And we got the receipts. Our nonprofit clients have seen incredible increases in giving that have allowed them to help even more people and make the world a better place. Get started today by visiting roguecreatives.com slash NPC. That's NPC for Nonprofit Connect. You can schedule a free brand consultation and take our free online brand character quiz. And we all know that everybody loves a good online quiz, especially when it's free. So get over there and do that because it's, it, why not? Why wouldn't you? You love it. It's going to be fun. That's roguecreatives.com slash NPC to begin defining your brand character today. There's no commitment or risk for you at all. And Honestly, we just can't wait to meet you. We, we kind of think we could be good friends. I think we could hang out. You could buy us lunch. We can help you with your branding and talk about the shows we're binging or whatever. It'd be nice. Rogue Creatives. Seriously, creative storytelling. All right. On with the show. Cherian, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to get to meet you and hear more about you. Before we... Jump in. We always start off with a few random questions. I have a long list of random questions, and then we have a randomizer that randomly selects three. Oh, fun. Yeah, little icebreaker. All right. 
What is your favorite animated film? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I'm going to probably have to go with Wally. It's an oldie, but a goodie. There's there's a good number of them that I just enjoy. First movie I ever saw in the theater was Transformers the movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wait, the animated Transformers the movie. The animated Transformers. Yes. Okay. From the 80s. Nice. Okay. But my parents weren't big like movie theater people, so I was actually pretty old when that happened, but I was still excited nonetheless. Very cool. Okay. Are you a dog or cat person? Dog. Don't even have to think about it. Okay, good. Then we can proceed. This call does not have to end. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and then do you have a comfort show, a show that you could just watch over and over and over again? Any of those shows from the 90s are great for me, like Frasier or Friends. I can just have those on in the background and just let it sit. Uh, the Office, of course, would be great. All good choices. Okay, you pass. <laughs> we will proceed. <laughs> nice. I, I kind of want to hear what other people have to say to that one. I'm like, huh, I wonder. <laughs> There's some shows you just can't have on the background. Like with binging The Blacklist recently because I'd never seen it and it just ended. And I typically wait for shows to end. But that's not what you can have in the background. You got to be in it. Definitely got to pay attention on a show like that. There's a lot of, a lot of details <laughs> you can't miss out on. Yeah. Yeah. That and like Breaking Bad or something like that. Those you, you really need to pay attention to. <laughs> yeah. Some friends just got me turned on to the bear on Hulu. Uh, so I binge that. That's another one you just can't have in the background. Yeah. There were times where I missed something. I had to rewind and watch it again. That one confused me because Hulu had it listed, I think, as a comedy. Oh, interesting. Or it said drama slash something like that. And I'd heard good things, but I hadn't heard anything specific. So we started it and I'm like, When's the funny part? I mean, it has little funny moments or whatever, but like, <laughs> yeah, this is not what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I definitely think, you know, if you're coming into it and hoping for some laughs, it's not, but it's really good. I, I mean, I, I love it. It was great. I just had to transition my mindset. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, let's get into it. You have a little bit of a history here in nonprofit organizations, but even beyond that, what's your origin story? How did you end up? where you are now and then tell us what you're doing now yeah so i started way back when with what my colleagues in the uk called chuggers um i was working for the sierra club and human rights campaign organizations like that walking around the mean streets of minneapolis asking people to make gifts at their door which you can imagine is a very fast way to get the door slammed in your face about a hundred times a night and did that quite literally every night during college. So it was a wake up call. It was fun. It was rewarding. I did that for a while, became the executive director of a couple of nonprofits within that network. So kind of got bit by the bug and then was working for another nonprofit organization in sort of like programs role, like doing some of their programs work and they needed help with a grant. And the person who was writing the grant didn't really know much about the program. So I got pulled into that. The person left and they made me the development director. So I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I got to get some help and got a mentor and got some professional development. And ever since then, this has been my career, my chosen field. And now I'm thrilled to, to have worked in a lot of different size organizations. But just recently, I, while I was working in one of those organizations, I built some software, turned out to be useful to some nonprofits, so much so that the company just bought it. So I am now working for them as part of that acquisition and thrilled to be able to do so. It's a great opportunity and excited to continue to serve the nonprofit sector in this different role. And that's iWave? It is, yeah. Okay. And what does iWave do? So iWave does uh, fundraising intelligence for nonprofit organizations. So typically think about wealth screening as a component of that, where you have information about your internal giving data, adding in information about what other organizations your donors are giving to, where they're giving, what that looks like, and then being able to create models around that for your donor base. So let's say you have 5,000 donors, for example, and you want to know who to prioritize for major gifts, who to prioritize for planned gifts, how to reach out to them. That's what iWave provides. And I was actually a customer of iWave before selling my company to them. So I was really thrilled by that connective tissue, but I was using iWave at the same time, kind of thinking through, like, how can I help put these pieces together in my old job? And so now we're excited to see how this will become better together. 
using the iWave data and what we can do with generative AI to just make it a little bit easier, a little bit faster for nonprofit to reach the people they need to reach. Awesome. Obviously, AI is sort of the buzzword. It's the thing. And yeah, I just literally got out of a meeting where we were talking about this. People seem to either be embracing it and running with it or scared to death of it or ignoring it. Those are kind of the three options, right? (laughs) What does that look like specifically in this area? And how do you see AI in general with nonprofits playing out like as a tool? So that's a big question to unpack. Let me start by just acknowledging that wherever you are on the fence, I probably agree with you. I think it's probably one of these things that I'm excited about, but also nervous about, particularly around specific use cases. So what we're doing is relatively straightforward. So fundraisers, nonprofit leaders, they know that they need to put information out there in the world about what they do, but they don't necessarily have all the time to be able to do everything that they know should be done. An example of that is some organizations may just do one appeal a year, and that's not necessarily great, or they may not be able to thank their donors in a timely manner because it takes so much time to write those letters. Uh, The other example is many people know putting information out consistently on social media will improve organic reach. It won't solve the organic reach problem, but it's a better way of getting there. So these are all situations where if you're wearing multiple hats, it's really hard to get stuff out there. But even if you're a larger organization, you have the more sophisticated understanding of your donor base. Like I mentioned, having different segments of first-time donors or lap donors or multi-year donors, creating different segmented pieces for those groups can take a lot of time. So AI has a tremendous opportunity to solve that problem if it can be done in a way that is, again, easy for the nonprofit to do that. And our hope is that nonprofit operating system does that for them. When you combine some of the data points that iWave has that can kind of help you with that segmentation, understand the segmentation at a deeper level and put out information at a constituent level, at a donor level, but also kind of create groups, that makes it super interesting. I think the one thing that I would say, Matt, is I think it's really hard to ignore AI right now. And just because it's coming at you from so many different directions, I just gave a presentation to a group of nonprofit leaders earlier today. And what I said was, it's not like cryptocurrency, where you can choose whether or not to fundraise, and you can decide if this is the right strategy for your organization or not. There's an element of you can decide how much to use AI, but it's inside of Google, it's inside of Microsoft tools. Anytime you open up a browser, you're going to be confronted by some elements of AI and machine learning. So it's happening to your organization, it's happening to you, it's also happening to your donors. So There's not a lot of avoidance that can happen. Now we're really in the future that continues to be a significant impact on our world. Yeah. And I mean, as I keep reminding people when I'm having these conversations and reminding myself, we're only really like a year into the world with AI as an active presence that we're interacting with, with like GPT and all of that. Obviously, there's elements of that that have been around. But while at this point, like you said, you can't avoid it. In small ways, pretty soon, I think you're not going to be able to avoid it in a lot of ways. It's going to be a part of our software, our phones. You know what I mean? That everybody's investing in it. I just read an article that Apple's investing billions in it to try and catch up with Siri and that kind of stuff. It's going to be everywhere. So I would imagine, like anything else, that balance of how do we harness the power of this for good (laughs) and uh, still retain our humanity in that. One of the things that I had heard, and I don't know if you can speak to this at all or not, but I'd heard somebody talking about with nonprofits in particular is using AI for grant writing and helping to kind of make that a simpler process because everybody in the nonprofit world knows that grants are wonderful and also the bane of our existence when (laughs) having to write those and finding people like I feel like everybody I know who's a grant writer doesn't even enjoy being a grant writer it's like you know like I guess I'll do that but have you heard much about or you have thoughts on that yeah I do there are some friends and colleagues who this is their passion and I want to honor that and, and I know that that's what they have studied and gone through professional development and some portion of or the entirety of their careers um It is not something that I personally love. It doesn't really bring me joy, but for some people it does. I think the key pieces of that is just like with any part of AI, there are 
parts of your job that you love to do, the parts that you really enjoy, and that's different for every person. And then there are parts that are just the drudgery. So for me, it might be sitting down and looking at a blank screen and writing stuff out. That's a drudgery to me. But talking to people, having those relationships, that's what I want to like fast forward toward, right? So if that's like you, if that's you listening, what I would encourage you to do is start exploring, playing with some of these AI tools and seeing if it can help you with that. In grant writing in particular, what I'm excited about is the opportunity to solve the asymmetric information crisis that exists between funders and fundees. So funders are asking for information because they don't have it. Sometimes they're asking for information they don't need. <laughs> and sometimes they're asking for it in a format that is especially onerous. So tools like AI can very quickly and easily solve some of those problems. It can reframe programmatic language. It can adapt it to meet funder requirements, in particular, like word limit. So one of the tools in the last job I was in in a nonprofit just a couple of months ago, we had to take big, bulky content and shrink it down to 300 words. And we actually sort of beta tested this in real time. We're all in a Google Doc. And I was taking content and dropping it into the nonprofit operating system and shrinking it to 300 words and putting it back into the Google Doc. And people are like, oh, that's pretty good. While other people were working on it by hand, and it took them quite a bit longer because our brains function where we try and pull out words and try and make that text limit or whatever. And AI just quickly rewrites it. So I found that really helpful. I think generally, ChatGPT and these other tools are not super great at writing grant proposals. They're fine. I mean, you get something out of it. What I'm excited about is the opportunity to use sort of a more advanced approach to that with grant writing professionals providing insight into how should these be crafted for different types of proposals, federal, state grants, foundation, corporate grants. And that's where I'm excited to explore um, where this could go in the future. But right now, I mean, if it's a struggle for you and you you want something and something's better than nothing, ChatGPT can do some of that. We built in some of the basic tools into nonprofit operating system to kind of get like a one pager or shrink the text or expand the text. But I'm waiting for the right thing because I don't want to do a disservice to the nonprofit community. Of course. Yeah. I think, you know, I mean, like I run a creative agency and I'm definitely not replacing the written content that we do with stuff that is produced by chat GPT or whatever, but sometimes it's helpful as a starting point or it's helpful as idea generator or those types of things. And I can imagine that even now in the grant writing process, it's not going to spit out something you could just send, but it might give you some things that are like simplify the process or speed up the process, make it a little more efficient for you because that's one of the, obviously, the challenges for our nonprofit leaders is they're trying to do the thing that they want to do to help the world, right? But then on top of that, they got to raise money. Fundraising is a huge part of their job. And then that, so that's already taking, and then things like grant writing and getting that stuff together and all the information you need can take a long time. So even just anything that simplifies, I think, is helpful. Absolutely. And I mean, with any of those things, whether it's ad creative or an appeal letter or grant proposal, I think the goal is to make everyone's job just a little bit easier so that it's faster to include our learned and lived experience in the process and then be able to develop out that bigger, bolder strategy. How do all these pieces fit together? I founded an AI company, a product, and I'm the first to say that AI is not going to replace any good fundraiser's job. There are still grant maker relationships to have, individual donor relationships to build. And it ultimately is a relationship business. But if we can expedite the stuff that is more of a drudgery, and like I said, if you love writing grant proposals or love writing ad copy or fundraising appeal, do that and then focus on the data analysis AI tools that are out there that are really potentially something that you don't love to do. Yeah, I was one of the things that my first sort of experiments with AI, I knew the next day we were going to be doing a kind of brainstorm meeting on how to do some marketing for a project we had going on. So the night before I thought, oh, I'll just type it all into chat GPT and see what it comes up with, like bullet points of here are some different things you could do. And then the next day we broke up into our groups and we spent about 45 minutes. We came together and we made our list and it was almost identical to the list. And I said, this is really actually cool because it helps us. Now we can go, OK, maybe we don't have to spend so much time on that part if it can do some of that. But now going through and actually fleshing out, OK, how do we do that and what does that look like? 
we can skip straight to that part, which is what we're good at and doing the creative on that and all of that instead of that could have saved us 45 minutes that we could have been doing the things that we're good at it, that it's not. We could be focusing on the things that we're good at. Yes, full stop. But I just want to add in, or you could go home. Like, I think there's so much that we, as nonprofit professionals, we overwork and we pour ourselves into the cause and late nights and weekends are par for the course. And somebody asked me last week, what does winning look like? And I said, winning looks like a nonprofit professional being able to close their laptop and be able to go home and spend time with their friends and family. That's what winnings. You get to go home on time. We talk about burnout a lot on this podcast and at our events because in the nonprofit space, it's this irony of you're trying to help people, but you're sacrificing yourself to do it to the point where I'm like, does somebody need to start a nonprofit to reach out and help nonprofit professionals? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> But we need to be better about the way we take care of ourselves. And a lot of that comes down to nonprofits are culturally expected to run things on a shoestring budget, you know, one person doing the job, five people, that type of thing. And we've got to get out of that. We've got to get away from those mindsets and start thinking like businesses so that we can take care of ourselves and we don't have one person doing five people's jobs. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's any better in the corporate world these days, but I think the the key piece that at least a lot of my corporate colleagues out there, you know, whether it's retail or banking or whatever it might be, are realizing is exactly what you're saying, that there are opportunities to sort of leverage technology and AI to solve some of the issues that do contribute to burnout and dissatisfaction at work. So if it's something like writing the first draft of content or helping with your calendar or analyzing the data, whatever it might be, you got to figure that out for yourself and for your organization and have policies around it and whatnot. But if the one thing that this sort of new age of AI brings to the sector is an even slightly better work-life balance, I'm all for it. That's a great perspective on that, especially in the nonprofit sector. But I think in general, you know, I mean, it's that whole idea of do we live to work or do we work to live? Do we live so we can work or work so we can live? And we get it twisted so much, I think, especially in our country. But in general, I think the world tends to focus on the work and at the sacrifice of what's important. Yeah. I mean, I think, unfortunately, we have the perspective that more is always better and that newer is always better. And it's hard to untrain ourselves from that mentality. So the more that we can kind of identify what are the things that don't actually matter. Writing the first draft doesn't actually matter. It doesn't. It's, as long as the final draft, they said, includes that lived and learned experience. And I mean, not just for nonprofits, but all of those people that are serving the nonprofit community as well, right? Consultants, how many more nonprofits could you serve with your expertise if you're leveraging AI as well? That's a great point as well. So if I'm a nonprofit leader and I'm not really in the tech world as you are, where do I start? Where do I go? Like, what are the AI tools or how would you suggest like breaking into that world and experimenting a little? Well, let me start by saying it's a little weird for me as well to be like, I'm in the tech world. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess. Because like a week ago, I wasn't. So it's a little for me to kind of wear that hat. So I just want to be mindful of the fact that I'm totally an imposter in the tech world. And what limited expertise I have in the nonprofit world, what I would say is, first and foremost, is really doing a values assessment for yourself and for your team and your organization, understanding kind of where you are on that spectrum. And I think in terms of change management, which I study a lot and coach organizations a lot upon, it really comes back to not jumping into the tactical piece, not just saying like, Let's do this. Let's try this, whatever, because it can get really frustrating and overwhelming for folks really quickly because there's so much in terms of the pace of change that it could contribute to that burnout, could contribute to that overwhelm. So what I say, again, this is just me, is that prior to figuring out your tech stack, you have to figure out your trust stack. And what I mean by that is among our team, whether it's an internal team of staff or the external stakeholders like donors or volunteers or community members, what's actually going to lay the groundwork for trust-built relationship? So are people concerned internally about jobs being lost or jobs being replaced? We've got to address that first. We can't jump into a tool 
if that's not being addressed. We're talking to donors and stakeholders. How is my information going to be used, right? And where is it going to show up? And is it going to be in a way that is inappropriate, whatever that might be? So understanding what constitutes trust is really important for every nonprofit, regardless of what technology you use. And so let's separate AI for a moment. How you use your donor information, your CRM, your database, it has all the same implications. How you use email. And there isn't a nonprofit on the planet that doesn't use email or some sort of technology anyway. So what I like to say is that trust is earned in drops and lost in buckets. So before doing any of that, figure that piece out, understand. Then what are the tools that actually lead to increased trust? Internally, that might be we want to focus on the tools that help us generate content and what type of content do we need? So to your point, is it grant writing or is it fundraising appeal, social media, whatever it might be, and then start evaluating the different tools that are out there. Of course, you can use free chat GPT, and that's one place to start. I would actually encourage people, as I mentioned before, I was doing a talk earlier today, I would encourage people to start with Anthropic. Claude is, from my vantage point, a more useful tool for nonprofits. It has some features that I love, but it also has a high priority on ethics. So a lot of what we do in the nonprofit operating system is built on Anthropic just because there's a lot of value alignment there. It's not that we don't use open AI, but we do, of course, but there's value to the different tools. But don't start exploring. Start playing with them within that kind of framework of why are we doing this and what are we trying to reach? And then start exploring, as I said, the, the tools that are appropriate to the goals that you have. So if it's writing, maybe Anthropic, if it's data analysis, there's all kinds of other tools out there. One that I really love is Accio, just like the Harry Potter, A-K-K-I-O, that is really fun to use and really cool. So that's one that I pay for. There's also just like ticky tacky ones, Matt, that people don't think about. But the best example is, I'm actually surprised it didn't show up here, but I use fireflies.ai in every meeting that I'm in. Before, when I was in a nonprofit, every donor meeting, every internal staff meeting, people knew it was there. We talked about it, let the elephant out of the room, but it was great because it was transcribing the meeting. And how many times do we have someone in a board meeting or in a staff meeting whose responsibility is to take notes and we're not getting their full participation because they're taking notes? So it's one tool that is indispensable to me. Firefly AI? Yeah, fireflies, plural, dot AI. So Zoom, which we're using right now, has this new AI summary tool that popped up a few weeks ago and has been surprisingly good. I mean, there's definitely some things in there that occasionally I'm like, I don't think that's what we said. But overall, like the way it summarizes and gives even like next steps and all that. Is that the same kind of thing? The one thing that I've missed with the Zoom one is now I'm like, oh, how do I get this in in person meetings? Because when we're having actually meetings around the table, and again, I'd rather have some people focusing and being a part of the conversation than taking notes. Can Fireflies do that somehow? Or is it's a pretty straightforward workaround? And admittedly, I haven't used the Zoom one, so I don't really know. But what I really like about the Fireflies one in particular, and I'm just happen to be biased, is that it allows you to ask questions of the transcript. So you can say, what did Matt say about Fireflies, for example? And it will answer that question, which I really find valuable, particularly in longer meetings where I'm like, what's happening on the 14th and uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. So it's been super helpful to me just because you don't always catch something and then you can always go back and rewind, replay that moment. You can actually literally replay the moment and listen to it, but you can also just ask it a question. I have to look that up. That's crazy. All right. Well, any last thoughts for nonprofit leaders out there who are, I mean, obviously fundraising is one of the toughest areas of nonprofits and you're providing tools to make that a little bit easier from all your experiences, either technologically or not. You have any insights or thoughts for them? I think the big thing that I would encourage everyone to kind of think about is why are we doing this? How of technology or whatever it is, doesn't really matter as, as you point out, has to marry the what and the why. And we got to get clear on our internal why, both individually and institutionally around why we're doing this. If it's just a play, let's be clear and upfront about we're just playing with the tools and seeing what it looks like and no harm, no foul, right? 
I don't know if that's really the right way to approach it from an institutional perspective, but we've got to be clear that there's the what, the tactical piece and the how and the why are all connected to one another. But ultimately, what I would say to folks is I was just giving a talk on technology adoption in nonprofits earlier this week. And what I said was the pace of change is rapidly increasing. The time for chat GPT to get 100 million users was super fast, but it was outpaced by Instagram threads, just to put that in reference. There's a lot happening around us and we're trying to keep pace and it can always seem like there's something more. Don't feel like you have to jump in both feet into any particular tool and just say, this is all we're doing. Don't forget that you have a lived and learned experience that actually makes a difference to your donors. And those are the relationships that matter. If this can get you to build those relationships more authentically, great. If it can't, then don't. You're going to be impacted by it no matter what, but you don't have to lean into it in its entirety. At the end of the day, I just hope that everybody listening is encouraged and is excited about where we're headed. And what I mean by that is now these tools are much more democratic. They're much more accessible than they were before. You don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or even tens of thousands of dollars. It's affordable for even the smallest organization. Free chat CPT is potentially an option for some folks, but that was out of reach. That was not possible for the longest period of time. And things like data and analytics, we didn't go to school for these types of things as fundraisers, but now we have access to them and that's super exciting. So be encouraged that the field is going to change, but we get to be part of that change and hopefully it empowers every organization out there to have a greater impact in the world around them. I love it. All right. We got some closing questions for you. Just general things, rapid fire style. What is the one thing that makes you feel most connected? I would say is the interpersonal relationships. I love meeting with other nonprofit professionals, other fundraisers, talking to them, hearing what they're doing and what they're struggling with. And that keeps me connected and grounded. And I love having those conversations. Is there somebody in the world of nonprofits that you would most like to take to lunch? I feel like I've taken a lot of people to lunch already. <laughs> There's probably a few people that I haven't taken to lunch lately that I need to catch up with. I would say that my friend, Pysley Williams, is one of the most insightful people that every time I sit down with her, I'm like, I just want to be her when I grow up. And I've known Pysley for most of my life, which is, I knew her before I was a fundraiser, which is funny, but one of the most brilliant, thoughtful, caring people. And anytime I would have a chance to go to lunch with Pysley, I would take it. Nice. Is there somebody in the world of nonprofits that you think we should be interviewing next? There's probably tons of people in the nonprofit space. I can give you a huge list of folks who are brilliant and thoughtful. One of the things that's really interesting to me right now is what's happening outside of the sector, particularly in technology and AI. So I'm following the folks at the partnership on AI and really understanding, and I have for quite some time now, to understand what they're doing and how they're thinking about it and how that can inform our practice. But I wouldn't want to single out like a particular person, but there's tons of people that would be great on the podcast for sure. All right. And then what aspect of your job brings you the most joy? I have the privilege of also, in addition to my job, being vice chair of professional development for the Association of Fundraising Professionals on the Global Board. And so not only do I get to help with the International Conference and AFP Lead, but some of the other professional development offerings that we have, the biggest joy that I have is being able to work with other fundraisers in particular when they're just getting started through the Fundamentals of Fundraising Program or advancing their career through the CFRE accreditation process. Had the joy to be able to do that for hundreds of fundraisers. And we'll be doing that later this month. But to be able to see someone get that credential that they worked really hard for, it means a lot. That's the thing that makes a difference. So for me, it's a huge privilege to be able to be mentored by people, now to be able to give back by helping people feel more confident about their fundraising skills and grow in the profession. It's just the thrill to watch. That's awesome. Because like I said, I think it is one of the more challenging aspects of nonprofit work and anything that can help people to enjoy that and do it better is a win. I think that's wonderful. All right. How do people connect with you and the work you're doing? I'm on LinkedIn and my name is pretty 
unique. So it's pretty easy to find me. There's very few Cheerians and very few Cheerian coaches out there. There is a Cheerian that works at T-Mobile, which is really funny. So we have that joke, but it, I'm not the guy that works at T-Mobile. I'm the guy that works at iWave now, but that's like to reach me. Okay, cool. And where can they learn more about iWave and the work you guys are doing there? Yeah, absolutely. Check out the iWave website. Right now, there's a great video and banner about Nonprofit OS. And you can also just check out the Nonprofit Operating System website at nonprofitoperatingsystem.com. So iWave.com, nonprofitoperatingsystem.com, all owned by the same company, but different offering. So let us know if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sharon, for being here today. This has been great and super helpful. Hopefully, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, my friends, we have come to the end of this amazing episode of Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes. You made it! Thank you so much for listening this far. And if you'd like to hear more from Nonprofit Connect brought to you by Rogue Creatives, make sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on so you don't miss out. We don't care which one. It doesn't really matter. Just just listen. Just subscribe. Just make it come right into your potholes every week so you can hear what's going on. Also, if you're interested in working with us or want to reach out and tell us how amazing we are, learn more, whatever it is, you can visit our website, npconnect.roguecreatives.com. Or just go to roguecreatives.com and you can find the rest. Okay, that's pretty much it. Okay. Bye-bye. Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes is hosted and executive produced by me, Matt Barnes, with an assist by my chaos coordinator, Tiffany Pope. Production is by our amazing friends over at Fame, the B2B podcast agency, along with Belinda Carter-Thompson and the team here at Rogue Creatives. Production lead is Luke Audi at Fame. Writing is by Sam Hollis at Fame and Matt Barnes and Taylor Bolanos from Rogue Creatives. Nemanja Koljaja of Fame is our audio editor, and Arslan Yakub from Fame is our video editor. Creative direction is by Corey Hill of Rogue. Our artwork is designed by Hope Kelly and Joshua Marino at Rogue and Ian Salas of Fame. Theme music is composed and performed by Jared Atherton of Chapters. Luke Audi of Fame does our booking and our guest relations. Huge thanks to our amazing guests for joining us for this episode and to all of you incredible listeners for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, and I don't know why you wouldn't have, don't forget to help us spread some good by giving us a good review. Preferably, you know, five stars with lots of words saying how amazing we are on whatever platform you're listening on. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever it is. Also, tell your friends and subscribe so we can come straight into your potholes each and every time we have a new episode. For more information about Nonprofit Connect or to join us at a live event here in Orange County, California, visit our website, npconnect.roguecreatives.com. We'll catch you next time. This has been a Rogue Creatives production.